back, everybody. Thank you for joining us again. Um, it's great that you're back. Um, we are going to now go into a presentation um, of Omashkega Land-Based Culture Resources by Jim Hollander um, from Omashkego um, Education. Um, I've got Jim's bio here. Jim um, is currently working as a curriculum developer based in Timmins. He has been very involved in First Nations education for over 40 years in a variety of capacities um, as a parent, teacher, principal, curriculum writer, student success leader, education partnerships program lead, and education services provider. His focus has always been on the importance of the three C's, children, culture, and curriculum. It's great to have you, Jim. Thank you. And uh, so um, before I uh, share my screen there, I'd just like to uh, uh, thank you for the introduction. And uh, those that are uh, in their homes or in their offices, uh, I'd like uh, you to uh, follow along with me. So uh, I'd like you to uh, give me a B, yell it out wherever you are. Give me an O, give me another O, give me an S, give me an H. Give me an O, give me another O. What does it spell? Yell it out. Boujou. So again, uh, greetings from the Meshkegawak territory. On our side, we say uh, Wachie. Uh, you say Boujou, it's all good. Uh, just a couple notes. I'd like to uh, note that uh, today is uh, International Women's Day. And again, uh, we like to honor all of our women, but especially our women in the territory for all those good things that you do. And of course, another note that the uh, International Men's Festival will be continuing for the remainder of the year. Uh, I only get to use that line once a year, so uh, take it for what it's worth. Uh, so again, uh, today uh, we're going to be looking at some of the resources that Omishkego Education has uh, prepared. And um, again, although the title reads Omishkego Land-Based Culture Tools and uh, guides. Um, these uh, toolkits are useful not only for the, those in the Omishkego territory, but also for those that uh, are in the rest of the, the NAN territory as well. So we will uh, go through this. And uh, again, um, the resources that I'm talking about or will be discussing our, our websites are available at the end of the presentation. We also have a PDF available on this presentation. And then um, if you have any questions following this, of, of course, uh, you can email me and I'll respond uh, uh, in kind. Uh, so it's a, what, what are these toolkits and guides? Well, they're just a collection of resources and they're designed to help parents and teachers uh, bring Omishkego land-based cultural experiences into their homes in the classrooms. So again, while they're based on Omishkego activities, and I have traveled in all of the NAN territory, many of these activities are suitable in uh, communities in uh, the central part of NAN and the western part of NAN as well. So these guides are all based around the simple premises that we want to provide opportunities for our children to experience Milo or Milo Pimantasiwen, uh, and that's based on the Omishkego cycle of life. This cycle of life is based on the land. So again, it, it reflects on wherever you are living in the territory and the, what is happening on the land at that particular time. Uh, that these toolkits and guides they incorporate good life for living well. And again, they can be used in both elementary and secondary grades. So a lot of people wonder, well, what is this Milo Mino Pimantasiwen? Uh, Milo Mino is just different dialect. It means good. Pimantasiwen means life. But again, what is the word derived from? Well, Pima is journey, movement. And it's that journey or movement on the land. And uh, this is, again, the life that the elders led, and that's the good life. Uh, my late father-in-law, when I asked him to tell me what that good life is, what Milo Pimata Siwan is, he told me it's taking food from the land, that's that physical thing, and then living on the land. That's that spiritual uh, part of, of that, that cycle of life. So this is what the elders uh, refer to when, when they are talk about that year-round cycle on the land, Milo or Milo Pimatasiwan. And again, it's broken down into several seasons. And uh, I think I skipped one here. Oh, sorry, I jumped ahead here. So again, what is the cycle of life? It's just based on the, uh, the um, moons, the seasons that uh, you see on the land at this, at, particular times of the year. We're in March now, so it's the Mikazobizum, Eagle Moon. 
And if you're in the Muscangular territory, you're going to start to see eagles coming in to the bay. And again, they're usually coming into the bay because they are usually here before the geese come, come in, which is the next season. Uh, and uh, again, the whole cycle of life is based on six seasons. And again, uh, usually the beginning of the year is February, which is the, the great moon. And the new year, which is this month now, March is the eagle moon. And again, when we talk about these things, it's always best, I always stress, it's always best to learn these things in the language wherever possible. So what are these six seasons? Again, there's winter, spring, blooming of the earth, summer, fall, and freezing up. And you might ask, well, why do we have these six seasons instead of the four? Well, four are, again, astronomical seasons, but the six seasons here are based on that cyclical movement of life on the land. Generally in the blooming of the, in the springtime, sorry, uh, people were not able to move very much because the rivers were starting to thaw and freezing up was another time of the year when people couldn't move as well. So they were generally stationary during those two times of the year uh, because of the, the change in the seasons. And this is the cycle of life model itself. And again, if you, if you look at it, um, you can see that uh, the, the illustrations done by the uh, late Richard Camelatizant show what is going on in the seasons throughout each of, each, each of, the, each of the moons. So again, we mentioned that we're in the March now, which is the Mikoso Eagle moon. And then the next one is April, and that's when the, the Canada geese come in, that's uh, Niskabizum. And then after that, we start seeing the frogs chirping and peeping, and that's Iligabizum. So it keeps going on like that. So it's, it's a very practical way of looking at the world because it describes exactly what's happening on the land at that particular time. So we want to talk about language. We're going to talk about culture as well. But when we talk about language, usually it's it's describes your identity, and it's usually not separated from culture. We do separate it for a lot of reasons, but it's part of culture. It's the way you describe the world around you. And if you're in our territory, for example, and you're living in Kasetjuan, you're a Cree person. If you're in one of the communities in Northwest Ontario, you would identify yourself as Oji Cree or, or Ojibwe. So even if you don't speak the language, that's how you identify yourself. So this whole idea of language, it's a very important concept. And it's again, an ultimate symbol of belonging. Uh, when we talk, oh, sorry, this one again here. So I'm jumping too, too ahead here. So when we talk about the, the language in uh, Ilodimo in the Cree language, um, it's different from the English language. And we have to be aware of the differences. And I'm just going to give you two examples. There's a whole bunch of them. Um, and again, the Cree, Oji Cree, Ojibwe, the languages are all similar. They come from the same family. So a lot of these things when, that I'm talking about are similar. So when we talk about English, it's subject, verb, uh, object oriented. And it's always deals with word order. Um, but Omishkego, it's different because it's verb based. And because it's verb based, it's always in action. The world is moving. And, and that's exactly what happens. Even if you're sitting in your office right now, the world is moving, or you're sitting in your in, wherever you are with a group of people, the world is moving, the world is rotating. So the Omishkego world always sees the world as moving. The English world sees it's generally is stationary. Uh, another difference in the language is the classification of gender. So Omishkego language, you have animate, living, or inanimate. And again, I can only guess why that is, is because of the importance of finding food while you're on the land would lead you to be describe things as either living or not living. And this is different from English, where you have the, the grammatical genders, masculine, he, feminine, she, or it, and all of these are culturally derived. So we have multiple genders now. Um, and, and, and again, those genders are derived from the culture. So when we talk about culture, the Omishkego people call culture as a journey or movement on the land. And when they talk about culture, they call it Utaskanasiwan, where you come from, Uta, to Itaskanasiwan, where you're going there. So looking back at traditional land-based activities is part of the journey moving forward. So did you know a solid foundation of one's culture, Cree, Oji Cree, Ojibwe, helps children establish a positive identity and helps them to become higher achievers in all aspects of life. So one of the reasons I focus on culture is because that is one of the primary determinants of 
one's identity. And if you know where you're coming from, you're going to know where you're going. And consequently, you're going to be a higher achiever in all aspects of life. In the late 1990s, we had a workshop. So at that time, the Omishkego Education and the Jibwe Creek Culture were working together on several projects. And one of them was a culture and language project. And at that time, um, the primary movers of that were John Beck. I'm just mentioning the names because they, they are still around and you might uh, come across them. John Beck was the director of education for Omishkego Education at the time. Diane Riopel was the director for uh, Ojibwe Creek Cultural Center. Greg Spence was the uh, language uh, coordinator for um, Omishkego Education and Jim Edrington was a cultural coordinator at that time. These were the main drivers of this project. And what happened was uh, they got together and I was a recorder based on this whole uh, endeavor was that we had 10 elders from the communities and we asked them to tell us about their practical experiences and life skills that they learned while living on the land. And the result of this workshop were these three resources that I'm going to be talking about today. The Omish Giggle Land-Based Culture Development Checklist, Parents Toolkit, the Omish Giggle Land-Based Cooperative Education Program, and the Omish Giggle Land-Based Camp Activities, Teachers and Principals Toolkit. So this meeting that we had in the late 1990s, there were multiple workshops, multiple meetings. We basically met with the elders and we asked them in the language what when and where did you learn specific activities? So the example I'll give is the simplest one is, we asked basically, when was the first time you picked berries? And they would tell us they were six, six years of age. And we asked them, of course, what berries did you pick? And they would tell us all the different types of berries that they picked. And then we asked them, when did you learn to pick these berries? So they would give us the season. So we went through multiple lists and conversations with the elders to determine exactly when a skill was learned and where it was learned. And again, from that came all of these resources. So the first one I'm going to talk about is the Overscale Land-Based Culture Development uh, Parents Toolkit. And again, what is it? It's just a series of checklists that are culturally relevant that describe things that students should learn at different ages. So we're not talking about school here. We're talking about ages of, of development in a child. And again, this project came about because uh, there were a lot of development checklists out for child development, for literacy development, for numeracy development, but we never had anything to do with uh, culture development. So again, these lists are, it's the second version of what came out of that elders conference or conferences that we had in the late 1990s. And uh, why does it say uh, 2021? Well, we couldn't find the, the original versions until uh, just uh, a couple of months ago um, to, to be able to do this. So again, when you see these lists, it's exactly what the elders have told us. We haven't changed it, um, but again, uh, it reflects culture of um, their, their knowledge at the time. So again, what, did, what are these checklists about? Well, they follow a child from six years to adulthood. And again, when we talk with the elders, we, one of the questions was, so when was someone competent in all of these skills? And they told us uh, around the age of 20. Uh, are, are your children or your community's parents uh, going to be able to have competency in all of these skills by the age of 20? Uh, probably not. Um, but again, we want our, our children, our parents, our communities to grow together and uh, uncover um, any of these uh, cultural skills um, as they progress uh, through this developmental, these developmental stages. So again, it won't be the same for everybody. Um, but again, uh, we want to, to make sure that they are taught in the language. So here's an example of uh, one of the, of the uh, lists there. So by age nine, so if you went into the resource, you would, again, see it from age six all the way up to adulthood. So here's an example of fishing activities that the elders told us that by the time you're age nine, you should be able to do these things. So general activities uh, involve uh, observing the locations of various species of fish. And the elders said at that time that by age nine, you should be able to set a net in the river, set a net near streams, set a net under the ice. You should be able to maintain a fish net, empty a fish net, handle equipment properly, and read water currents and signs and ice conditions and signs. So these are general things that a child by the age of nine should be able to do. Again, the, the, the proviso here is that many of these activities, the kids were already living on the land for, for uh, extended periods of time. Um, there wasn't as many. Um, uh, kids living uh, in, in the communities. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, there weren't uh, 
um, people living full time in communities when when the elders told us many of these things. So again, you'd have to adjust them according to the development uh, of your your own child or the students in your care. So when we looked at the specific ones, again we asked again when was the first time you angled for pike with with a rod and a reel. So when was the first time you went fishing? And then they told us, you know, spring, summer, and fall we did that. When did you do that for walleye, uh, ugo? Um, they told us spring, summer, and fall. Uh, speckled trout, lake trout, sturgeon. Um, again, we asked specifically about each of these, and then they told us these were the times that we were, were did these things or we learned these things. Um, so some things again here, like jigging pike with hook and line and netting lingcod, loche, maria. Uh, again, they're not as common, but again, we have them in here because uh, you might do them. I have done these things, uh, believe it or not. Um, and uh, again, we want to make sure that uh, our kids are have a well-rounded uh, idea of what specific activities uh, they could be involved with with fishing. Again, it continues, uh, netting sturgeon, netting pike, uh, whitefish, spearing fish, trapping sturgeon, pike, suckers, whitefish, and uh, making nets with uh, floats and uh, stone sinkers. So again, here's some more activities that kids should know. Are they going to be able to do all of them? Maybe not, but again, we want our kids, our, our families, communities to, to uh, you know, do as many of these things as possible, um, again, depending on where you are. So the next program that came out of that, those elder meetings in the 1990s was the creation of a Nomashkego land-based cooperative education program. So this was first done in 1999, believe it or not. And at that time, uh, the, the um, former Grand Chief, Jonathan Solomon, was the Director of Education uh, in uh, St. Andrew's School in Kisechuan. Uh, John Long was the principal. Um, after that, Judy Stephen was the principal. All these individuals um, were the ones that provided impetus for this particular project. So the question was, well, if we are in our communities, why can't we have our students and high school students in this case um, get credit for engaging in land-based uh, experiences. And again, um, that was the task. And then what arose out of that was uh, to um, develop a program that meets the ministry standards. So again, it was originally written in 1999 uh, in conversation with people that had been running that program throughout the years, especially Judy Stephen, who I've already or mentioned, uh, suggested some revisions. And of course, the ministry um, documents uh, changed as well in 19, 2018. So again, everything had to be updated. So this is a ministry, uh, meets ministry standards. Uh, it's a land-based program. So instead of kids having to do their community-based service in a store or the clinic or, or band office, uh, they can actually get credit for engaging in land-based uh, activities. The credit value is two, it could go up to four. Again, that depends on the principal and uh, how they want to um, uh, distribute those uh, particular credits. So what is it? It contains three different guides. So there's a policy procedures guide for principals and teachers. So that's administration stuff. It has forms, it has uh, policies that follow the ministry uh, guidelines, but also uh, local community guidelines. There's a course profile teacher's guide. So that's the teacher's manual. Basically, and there's a course activities and assignment student guide. So that's the student workbook. So there's three different resources that are uh, have been developed for this program. So it's it's extensive. I mean, if you want to run this program, all the resources are there. Uh, of course, you will have to adapt them to meet your own local community needs. So, as we mentioned before, the community-based portion of it is not in stores or offices. It takes place out on the land. And these land-based activities were broken down into three different categories, wildlife harvesting, wildlife preparation, and traditional tools and technology. The benefit of this program is it's very flexible and it can address both the local economic and educational challenges. So if you want your students to get credits, this is one good way of them to be, to be able to achieve that goal. And it also addresses local economic issues. Again, uh, having lived in the communities and knowing uh, you know, the cost of, of food to buy in the store, it makes a big deal if you can get food from the land, and not only in terms of uh, financial reasons, but also in terms of health reasons. Um, so again, programs like this uh, help not only their children in terms of their education, but also in terms of uh, 
you know, providing sus subsistence uh, harvesting or food preparation activities. So all of the activities, again, focus on material economy. But again, once you get out on the land, then you start dealing with other aspects of the culture, the worldview, language, uh, uh, social interactions. All these things happen once you get out onto the land. And these teachings, when you're out on the land, they incorporate almost cable approaches to teaching and learning, which are a little different from what goes on in the classroom. So what are these almost cable teachings and learnings? Well, almost cable have two words for education, kiskinomakwewen, which means empowering others for knowledge and kiskomasewen, empowering oneself for knowledge that's learning. So teaching and learning are part of the same thing. And when you think about it, you know, I've always said that uh, working with, with teachers, that a good teacher is a good learner. The best teachers are the best learners. And we continue to learn uh, as, we, as we progress through our lives. And this is this lifelong learning uh, that we hear so often about. So again, to more Skago people, teaching and learning are part of the same thing. Obligations are the same, whether you're, you're empowering others for knowledge or empowering yourself for knowledge. And we're all learning together. That's Kiskanoma took. So what is this course all about? And again, I'm not getting too heavy into this, the, the schooling part of it. Um, again, that's all available in the resource documents. But uh, uh, again, 70% of the course is based upon uh, these uh, assessments conducted throughout the course. So like every other co-op program, you have pre-placement orientation, which is 10%, classroom integration, uh, which is 20%, which are classroom activities that integrate um, formal teaching with what's going out on the land, and then the community placement, in this case it's land-based learning, which accounts for 40% of, of the final mark uh, in, in terms of that uh, part of the assessment uh, st strategy. Uh, and then finally, 30% of the grade is based on an inquiry project, and that's administered usually towards the end of the course, and that, that project itself is based, is land-based itself, so it deals with issues on the land that the students may have encountered or is is uh, in 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 our current uh, frame of mind. So it can deal with experiences on the land, uh, with ring of fire or something that's coming up. Um, so uh, the the inquiry projects can deal with many different things, but it generally deals with things that are occurring on the land. And that 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 inquiry project is uh, thirty percent of the final mark. So again, it's based on ministry. Everything here is is what is expected in in, in a ministry program um, that that is uh, a, a, has a community placement. However, the difference here being is that this is land-based. So for cooperative education program, we talk about these three areas, harvesting, preparation, traditional tools and technology. So again, we can't go through them all, but I'll go through a couple of them with you. So harvesting includes all those activities related to fishing, hunting, trapping, and snaring. Preparation includes activities associated with uh, preparing and gathering wild food, berries, plants, hides, and clothing. So, because life on the land at Milo Pimantasiwan is all about getting food, the majority of the activities that we talk about in this course deal with harvesting and preparation of wildlife. An additional course was added later on, again, because people have requested this, and this is traditional tools and technology. So this involves creation and production of craft technology. I'm sure you've all seen tamarack geese and things like that. Well, that's craft technology. They did have a practical use at one time, um, but, uh, uh, now they are, are often uh, made uh, for, for sale uh, to, to different gr groups of people. Uh, the manufacture of traditional travel and transportation equipment, that could be snowshoes, uh, and, uh, paddles for canoes and things like that, and then the construction of traditional housing. So that's not only include the, the housing that, uh, that um, existed in the past, as weekends and, and uh, uh, brush shelters, lean-tos and things like that, uh, miguams, but it also includes some modern day types of traditional housing based on the land, which could include uh, a, a canvas tent. So here's an example of, again, wildlife harvesting, staring and trapping activities. So here are the general activities again, that children can take part in. They can set snares. They should be able to check and maintain snares, empty and remove snares, set traps. Uh, check, maintain traps, empty, remove those traps or snares. They should be able to handle this equipment safely and they should be able to read fur bearer movements and signs. So these are just some general things that a student could do if they chose to do uh, trapping and snaring activities. So again, this is just one thing that kids could do to, to get their credit. 
So then we get into more specific activities. So again, a child might not necessarily do all of these, but again, depending on who they are with out on the land, they could learn um, either one or two of these or, or, or more. Again, depending on who's teaching them these specific skills. So for specific traffic and steering activities, the choose, student can choose working with the, the cultural expert, the, the person that's teaching them this, uh, any of these activities or, or all of them. And again, in terms of ministry expectations, it's all based on time hours. Uh, generally, a course is 110 hours. So again, a student's expected to have a certain number of hours and they can get those hours by performing or learning about these specific activities. So again, snaring, trapping, um, all different types of animals. And again, it tells you when uh, the elders told us that these activities occurred. So again, for a student who was interested in trapping and snaring activities, um, again, depending on how the school organizes it, uh, they could choose from this menu of those activities that they wish to learn and master. Also, as part of wildlife preparation, we talked about you know, manufacturing clothing. So I'm just going to, going to give you an example here. So what could that entail? Uh, it could be uh, making beadworking patterns. Uh, it could be uh, silk uh, work. Uh, again, different types of patterns and designs. And again, obviously safety is a, is a concern. So every, every area we talk about, whether it's wildlife preparation, wildlife harvesting, or tools and technology, we always make sure that the safety element is, is clearly written down or, or noted. Uh, so we continue with some specific clothing manufacturing activities. So these are, again, things could find uh, someone who is able to do this kind of work and then uh, actually start uh, to uh, uh, make, for example, a moss bag, Gospis Yen, which is a, a, the bag where, where the, the kid was put in, uh, cradle board covers. So you have, we have cradle boards, everyone's seen them, but there's a cover on top that, that uh, are unique to the person who makes them. Uh, they could make uh, rabbit skin garments, buckskin garments, tanned hide garments, headgear, uh, moccasins, winter moccasins, those with ankle flaps that, that, that you wear, especially when the weather's dry, when you're using snowshoes. They can make mittens with duffel and tanned hide, um, rabbit skin sleeping robes, feather blankets, uh, summer moccasins. And so again, if a child was interested in making clothing items, they could select from this menu those ones that they might be interested in making. And uh, of course, finding someone who can uh, teach them these specific skills. So again, it not only helps the individual, but it also brings the, the, the school into the homes or the, in the community in terms of uh, teaching these specific skills. And again, when we talk about tools and technology, some general activities, uh, you know, the kids should be able to identify different types of housing. They should be able to know what, for example, the difference between a Shkigan and a Miguam is, a uh, Shabwatwan, they should be able to know the difference between these types of housing and why they're used. They should be able to be able to select the tools and materials to make that particular type of housing. They should be able not only to make it, but to maintain it. Uh, and again, the thing there would be if you make a shelter, then maybe live in it, uh, have kids live in it overnight or, or for a couple of days. Uh, and then again, safety is always the issue. So we talk about traditional uh, housing tools and, and using these materials safety. So again, what are some of the shelters that they could um, learn about and, and, and build? And again, Miguam, again, it's a conical dwelling used you're normally in the spring and the summer. And again, they could uh, build it, take it down. Um, they can make one with canvas, make one with bark. They can make a Shabbaton, which is uh, also called a teaching lodge. Um, so again, not only making these things, but uh, taking them down and uh, responsibly on, on the land. Uh, uh, they can construct an Ashkigan, which is a wooden uh, structure. Um, and again, uh, they could uh, have, should be able to, to make these things and then uh, also, also take them down and remove them. Uh, we talk about uh, temporary shelters, open brush or lean-tos. Again, many of the elders in the past, if they were traveling they, they, away from their homes uh, hunting, they would just make a, uh, an open brush or lean-to shelter. And, and again, it's, it's a practical thing that kids might want to do. And of course, erect a prospector tent, and uh, which most communities and most people use now when they are traveling out on the land. So the point here again is that if a student was interested in uh, traditional housing, they could actually uh, find someone that could teach them and show them how to make these things 
uh, whether it's a, a more traditional type of housing or a more contemporary type of housing, such as a prospector's uh, tent, um, and, and to get credit for it. Uh, so the internet is a wonderful thing. I've always heard that the First Nations people have been here since time immemorial, and uh, here's proof. I don't hear any laughing because it's a one-way communication here. So, so uh, another uh, more recent gathering we held in uh, Timmins here actually took place in 2019. So. 20 years later, we had another gathering, and this time Omaskego Education hosted it, and it was for Cree language and culture teachers. We had 44 elders, language teachers, culture experts, and community members that were uh, attended this gathering, and uh, many things occurred during this gathering. It was, it was the last one we were able to have uh, before COVID struck, unfortunately. We would like to continue this, this process. Um, but again, uh, basically it was about storytelling, traditional teachings, and again, we were looking at uh, land-based camp expectations and, 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 and school-based cultural expectation activities. Uh, and again, um, these people are the experts. These are the ones that, uh, you know, are the ones that need to tell us, just like the elders in, in, in the 1990s told us. Uh, these were the people that uh, gave us insights into uh, current practice in terms of uh, the culture. So the focus here was on land-based camp activities and school-based culture expectation activities. We're not going to talk about the school-based activities here. Uh, that's an ongoing process, but we will talk about the land-based camp expectations. The one we'll think about this just as an overview is that when they completed all of the activities, um, pretty well 80% of what the elders had told us 20 years earlier was still being practiced. So that's a wonderful thing for me because it, it tells us that the culture is being maintained and we can add on to it in terms of re revitalization um, by projects such as, as the one I'm going to be talking about. So the, the project is the Land-Based Camp Activities Teachers and Principals Toolkit. And again, we want high quality land-based cultural experiences. So again, one of the, the things I noticed uh, when, when I participated in these things or people showed me these things is that um, it wasn't clear some, sometimes exactly what was going on, except for the fact that the kids were out on the land. So one of the things we wanted to do is kind of firm that up a bit and make it a little more rigorous, uh, just like our expectations for things that go on in the school. And uh, it, as a result of that, um, we developed this, this resource. So it includes uh, policies, procedures. So again, if you don't have them, there are examples available here. Uh, actually, we borrowed them from uh, DDEX, uh, Dolores D. Eacham School and Moose Factory. They uh, get, consented to uh, allow us to use their uh, policy and procedures for, for land-based or outdoor education activities. Um, the doc document describes general and specific camp materials and resources uh, that you would, would need, uh, specific expectations in terms of activities that could occur in these camps. And again, they're arranged around uh, not the six seasons, we added an, an, another one here, it's added around seven seasonal camps. So we added one extra one here because even though our activities are land-based. There's one that's not included, in, and it, it, it's the summer celebrations camp. So uh, again, my experience living in the communities, we have uh, summer celebrations. Most communities have them, and uh, it, it's just as important as, as the more formal land-based activities that, that we all um, know. So again, we, we broke it down into a series of camps, things that might occur. Again, you can adapt them to your own situation. It's, it's not, and nothing's carved here in stone, so to speak. It's just a series of, of camps that give you an idea of what you might want to see happen in those camps. Or if you're looking to find people that can run these camps, uh, you can ask people, well, what can you do this, this, or the other? So again, here are the camps. There's a winter fishing camp. There's a spring goose camp. There's the blooming of the earth or a summer fishing camp, the summer celebrations camp. There's the fall goose camp, a fall or winter moose camp, and there's freezing up or trapping and snaring camps. So these are the different camp activities. And for each of them, we have detailed resources in terms of what is needed to run the camp, but also in terms of what activities or experiences our children might, um, or what things our children might experience during these camps. So each toolkit contains, in the, each camp in the toolkit, sorry, contains a general trip and camp organizational activities, general and specific harvesting and preparation activities, 
or expectations and specific camp resources. So uh, fall goose hunting camp is going to have specific resources that a, a winter moose hunting camp is, is going to have. So again, there's specific resources identified that that camp might have that another camp might not have. So there's a lot of general things when you go to a camp um, that are, are consistent across all of them, but there are some, some that are specific to that uh, particular uh, seasonal camping experience. So here's an example of a spring goose or waterfall hunting camp. And again, these are the general expectations. The ones that are italicized were the ones that were recommended by the, the Korean language and cultural teachers at the gathering. Um, so uh, when we asked them what are some of those general things that kids should be able to do or people should be able to do at a spring goose camp, they said make moss, canvas, snow, brush, or willow blinds. Uh, they should be able to burn wooden geese wooden goose decoys, they should be able to call geese and ducks, and they should be able to read uh, geese and duck movements and signs and the winds and things like that. Um, so the other, the elders at that time also talked about laying out decoys, which is again kind of in indicated when we talk about burning wooden decoys. If you burn them, you're going to have to lay them out, of course. Maintain, take down blinds, handle guns safely. So again, this whole idea about safety is, is predominant through all of these things. So these are the, the, the expectations or things that generally might occur at a spring goose camp. Again, we, we continue with some specific things now. So again, it's springtime. And I, I go, of course, in the Omishkego territory, spring goose hunt is a big thing. Uh, I know that it does occur in, in the central and the western parts of the Nan Territory, not to the, the extent that it does on the coast. Um, however, the, these things can be done. Um, so again, a specific activity would be to build a goose, Canada goose blind, a call and shoot Canada geese, and, and of course it's spring, so you have opportunities also to call and shoot various types of ducks. And again, because it's spring, it's important that our students understand about ice conditions and, and signs at that time of the year. Um, so as part of that, uh, like I said, I always advocate when you do any type of activity, when, especially when it deals with food, you go from hunting, trapping, staring the food to actually cooking it, preparing it, and then actually sharing it with uh, either those in your community or uh, elders, what have you. So I always like to see the full process because that's what it's all about. I don't like to see things separated out. So when we talk about hunting geese, there's more to it than just hunting uh, geese or ducks. Um, we want our kids to also be able to handle these foods properly. There's, there's etiquette in terms of how you handle meat and how you prepare it. Again, safety is a big issue here. So once you shoot the goose, what do you do with it? And um, Here's an example of, of seven thing, uh, things you can do with the geese. So um, I was reminded of um, Paul Simon's song, uh, 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover. I know I'm dating myself. Um, and in that song, you think, I only think he names four or five ways to leave your lover, but you know, that's Paul Simon for you. Uh, I know that when you're on a dash eight, you know, there's four ways to leave it in the case of emergency. Uh, but uh, most importantly, there are seven ways to uh, cook a goose and here, here they are listed. So you can boil goose, you can smoke goose, shinka Michigan, you can smoke goose with the sternum removed, miko again. you can make smoked goose with no bones in the mess stick, you can roast goose from a frame, sagabon, you can put it on a stick, on a grill with green sticks, apwan, or you can make salted goose, shihigwan, uh, shihigwan, and uh, these are the seven ways to, to actually to, to cook a goose. Some of them are not common anymore. When I first went up north in the 80s, uh, I did have, they did store uh, goose in lard, and they did make salted goose. The reason was at that time, um, there was only a community freezer and uh, people still had to preserve their food, their meat um, using these types of techniques. So uh, again, if you wanna pre uh, preserve your food uh, and you don't have a, a freezer available, then you could store it in lard, you could make salt goose, and of course you could uh, dry, dry goose over a fire. Um, make small goose. So these are some of the things that you can do. Again, as a child going to learn all these things or student or, or community member, not necessarily, but whatever you know you can use in your community, whatever is being used in your community is something that our children uh, can learn. So other things that you could do with goose, you could roast the wings on a fire. Again, I have done that as well uh, in the past that everything on the goose was eaten and there's meat between the wings. And uh, we did that. Uh, some communities still preserve goose by canning, uh, especially in Pewanik. Um, they still can moose, goose, lots of other things 
Um, again, if your community does it, then uh, you know it, it'd be something that should be encouraged. Um, and then preserve geese outside in cool weather. The kids should be able to pluck, gut, and clean ducks, well ducks, and roast ducks. So these are all kinds of activities that our kids can do. So when you're at a camp, as I mentioned before, there are other things you can do. And one of the other things you can do in, in addition to hunting is you can, can make other types of foods. And one of the other types of foods you can make is bannock. So again, kids should know how to make bannock and that there are indeed different types of bannock you can make. Um, there's a baked bannock, fried bannock, bannock on a stick, bannock with raisins. So again, depending on the knowledge of the people that you have in your communities, that these are different types of bannock that uh, you, know, you could make at that spring goose camp. Some other things you can do with geese. So again, we talk about hunting the geese to cooking and eating the geese and using the parts of the geese in, in, in terms of uh, the culture. While well, you can make blankets and pillows from the feathers, uh, you can use wings as sweepers, you know, clean your tents. Uh, again, not as calm, but still, you know, indicated by the people that attended the, the gathering in, in 2019, you can decorate the goose head as a sign of respect and or decorate wings for dancing. So one of the things that when we talked about this, they were firm on telling us, everyone, that um, when we talk about harvesting activities, um, to include the following practice, which, is, which are treating owls with respect, and these are gifts from the creator, taking only what is needed to live on, uh, to share with others, and to use all parts of the animal. So these are four things that we were told to include in this resource, and there they are. So with the Omishkego land-based culture kits and guides, there are several resources available. So when we talk about the uh, land-based cooperative education program, the teacher's guide, the principal's guide, the student's guide, it's available at this website. It's a bit.ly link. So again, you type it in and it'll bring you up to uh, Google Drive uh, folders and all these resources are available for download. When we talk about uh, the land-based camp activities, so again, if you look at the link, go to the link, you will find the total document, one uh, all together, and you will also find uh, separate resources by uh, camp. So if you want, are only interested in a fall uh, goose camp or a winter fishing camp, you can actually pull that specific uh, resource uh, out. And then uh, finally, the de parents' development uh, checklist. Um, again, these checklists are, are mentioned here at the website listed. The complete document is available, but also the individual uh, checklist by grade um, are also uh, in that particular folder. So did you know that developing strong relationships between parents, teachers, extended family members, elders, cultural experts, and knowledge keepers is important for a child's success in life, now you know. So that's uh, my presentation. And we're gonna... So if again, if you have any questions, the PDF file is available and uh, um, my email, I guess is available as well. So feel free to email me. And I'll uh, more than more than likely I will I'll respond to what you have to tell me. So I thank you very much for uh, and your patience for listening to this. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Jim. There's a lot of great information there. I know I learned a lot. I didn't know a lot of that was available. So very informative. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, we're all wrapped up for that session. Um, so that was our last session um, for the day. Um, so before we move on, um, we'll get um, our tech there to pull up our um, slide for with our word for the day, our word for the event. There it is. Um, so yeah, so for this session, your play to win code is tradition. You want to make sure you enter that in um, once you leave the screen or once you attended the closing ceremonies, just make sure you enter that for a chance to win. Um, and then that's everything. So thank you all for attending and uh, we'll see you in the closing ceremonies, hopefully. <laughs>